In towns throughout North America, the annual fair brings an excitement that is unequal. Families come from miles around to show off the best of the year's work. The arts and crafts display usually includes an exhibit of quilts. the grand champion quilt in the fair and I was fortunate enough to win that honor. <laughs> I felt as though I hated to part with it because uh, I felt it was something special. It wouldn't matter to me if I come last. It's just the satisfaction of entering in the fair or you know somebody else seeing my work and I'm looking at somebody else's, somebody else wins, that's fine. I've been making quilts all my life, first of all for the children when they were small, if anything I could get a hold of. And then later on I started making them just for pickup work or exhibiting. Human beings have always felt the need to create beauty in everyday life. This one's nice. Mm-hmm. Nowhere is this more evident than in the dazzling colors and intricate patterns of the quilt. These warm bed coverings are at once practical and beautiful useful works of art, labors of love. A judge looks for overall design and pattern in quilting, the materials chosen, general workmanship, and the evenness and quality of stitching. And there again, we have a little problem with the edges rolling. It doesn't lie as a complete. Do you see it? She's put her binding on there. She's had a little problem with that. The circles are very well done. Although 8 to 10 stitches is the average, some quilters can boast 16 stitches to the inch. Mrs. Margaret Carr has been making quilts for over 40 years. I find trouble in deciding on a pattern to do my quilting. You should do something on the bowl and around the uh, foot and, of course, the flower and the stem and the leaves. And here you would do it around the arm. I first started quilting in the mid-30s when I taught school up in Halliburton County. I usually did the blocks when I was away from home. I couldn't set up a big quilt in someone else's home. I did that when I came home during the summer, or some of them maybe carried over till I had a home of my own. I think this might have been the first pattern that I ever made back in the 30s when I started. It was relaxing and interesting work to do on the long winter nights. Cloth was rare and expensive in Pioneer North America, and the long winter season provided the time for women to stitch together pieces of old clothing to make quilt covers. Using the intricate colors and patterns of nature, the patchwork quilt was born. The study of quilts is a full-time occupation for publisher Mary Conroy. Quilting in Canada came with the immigrants from the European countries, mainly the British Isles, uh, first of all, of course, from France, and each of them brought with them something unique. The British brought uh, techniques of patchwork. The German quilters tended to quilt on whole cloth, and they had very elaborate and traditional designs. The second great wave of immigration came by land, and these were the people from the United States who had decided not to uh, live under a republic. And they brought with them very unique skills in quilt making. It was very much part of their tradition that the patchwork quilt had become, at this point in time, symbols of their folkways. A quilt on a bed symbolizes to a great many people some of the most significant times in their lives. Um, if you think about it, most of the important events in our lives happen in bed. We're born in bed, we get married, and we usually die in bed. 
And the settlers who first colonized Canada left everything except their bedstead. A love of quilting has lasted more than 70 years for Mrs. Annie Mae Johnston. I make quilts. Um, I attribute that to no rooms as I'm in the, in the bones. And those hands are busy all the time. 1909 was my first quilt. And all down through the years, I have made so many quilts. For, especially when the war was on, I didn't work hard at quilts at that time. They used to have a... Uh, down here in the hall, the ladies would be cutting out uh, things to send to the boys, and the clippings would be put in a box and sent up to me at the farm, and I would make quilts up there uh, uh, with the sewing machine and send them down here, and they would quilt them to send overseas. I've been making them ever since, and I love quilts just as much, much more than I, ever, than I did at the 1909. This is an interesting quilt because it's not only um, embroidered with the place where the quilt was made, but it also has the date on it, 1899, the height of the craze for Victorian patchwork. Crazy quilts were uh, really show quilts. They were made to display the lady of the house's virtuosity with her needle. In fact, you were considered to be a very poor needlewoman if you couldn't put at least 100 different stitches on your crazy patchwork quilt. In the 60s, the artistry that has always been present in quilts began to be recognized. They started to appear in art galleries, museums, and shops. One collector who turned her fascination with quilts into a business is Gloria Rosenberg. Rather nice in, in execution. The first uh, Saturday that I was open, I came home and my husband asked me what kind of a day I had. And I told him it was simply a terrible day. And he said, what was the matter? And I said, well, you know, someone came in and bought a quilt. And he says, well, honey, you're in business. And I just burst into tears. I really found it very difficult to sell quilts that I have lived with and that I love. But I'm over that now, and I really I like, I like it when someone nice buys a nice quilt. Quilts have also been a means of expressing beliefs. In the 19th century, American women included black patches in their quilts to protest slavery. Today, artist Joyce Whelan uses quilts to convey her social concerns. that the quilt was a good platform for politics. The circular quilt called Arctic Day, probably the most important piece because it's unusual and different to the other quilts because it has drawings on it. There are animals, birds, and insects of the Arctic. But I think the water quilt is successful. It's a quilt that essentially looks very innocent. It's 64 little pillows that I have embroidered upon them, Arctic flowers. When the flap is lifted up, there is a text about a group in Washington and the government who decided to make a plan to reroute the major waterways of the Canadian Arctic south to the United States. I thought that it would be a great way to show this kind of insidious plot underneath these little flaps. When quilting began to seriously decline in Canada, just around the end of the 20s, um, in the early 30s, Lady Tweedsmere was the wife of the Governor General of Canada at that time, and she could see that there was a lessening in the quality of work being done. And so she had commissioned some good work done and circulated it to all the women's institutes across Canada. It's called the Tweedsmere Collection, and they still have it. And women could see what good quilting was, and they could work towards it. And it's this group of people who have really kept alive the art of quilting. Traditionally, women's institutes and churches raise money by quilting. All our mothers quilted here years and years ago. Grace Hamilton and Olive Kittle and I came over 40 years ago. We've been quilting. We practically started when we were teenagers. Debbie here is a new member, and she's doing very well because she likes the work. And uh, she liked it so well when she started here that she's got a quilt just about made. 
You know, we used to sell them for what, $25? Grace and I pieced a very attractive brown and tan quilt years ago. We cut the patches. The lady provided all the material. We put it together. We brought it here and quilted it and charged the lady $8. Some people, when there's an important occasion, either in the national life or their own life, uh, might write a poem about it. Someone else might write a song, but many people make a quilt. The Canadian centennial brought about a quilting renaissance, sparked by the use of quilts in the restoration of pioneer homes. A whole generation of women had skipped the uh, learning of quilting from their mother because these women were involved in wartime work, and they just plain never learned to do it. So they had to be taught by someone, and this is when they began to involve themselves in guilt. Still predominantly a rural craft, quilting is becoming increasingly popular in cities. Enthusiastic newcomers gather in groups, such as the Etobicoke Quilters Guild, founded in 1975 by Sandy Small. I wanted people to be able to get together and exchange patterns, exchange ideas for quilts, and just general stimulation to carry on with their quilting after they finished my lessons. And that's how the Etobicoke Quilters Guild came into being. I think the interest in quilting has stemmed in, in a great part because I think people like to think that they can go back to their roots, uh, the natural way of doing it. There's natural health foods. People are getting back into natural fibers for sewing. I was an oil painter, just a Sunday oil painter, before I got into quilting. And um, I find I have both types of work on, on the go, traditional and also the, um, the wall hangings, which I really enjoy doing. I wanted to make a farm quilt, and I put the animals around the outside and the path going up to the farmhouse and the barn. My son wanted me to put a tractor in. That was his contribution, so I didn't want anything too busy in the background. Therefore, I just put the straight lines in. The path, if you'll notice, has a cobbled effect, and um, around the duck, it's, it's outlined with um, waves and so on. I didn't want anything to take away from the actual pattern itself. I think quilting's here to stay, and I think it's going to be very interesting to, to see what we'll leave. Combining innovative methods and ideas, large quilts bring warmth and texture to modern office buildings. One artist who specializes in wall hangings for public places is Lori Swim. I don't make bed quilts, I make wall hangings with fabric, which happen to be quilted to give a dimension. This one was um, designed for a competition in Nova Scotia. They asked us to submit designs for particular areas. And this one I chose to do because I thought it would be good for a waiting area. Quilting as a textile art has begun to attract the attention of men, such as John Willard. I got started in quilting by uh, amassing a collection of antique quilts over a period of about six years. And um, when I had this collection together, I began wondering what it must be like to make one. The Broken Star quilt is the first quilt I ever did, the I ever finished. The first one I've actually started, I still haven't finished yet. I basically designed my own, and I thought I'd do a commemorative quilt of the sinking of the Titanic. It was the 65th anniversary that year, I think, in 1977. It, it's a subject that's fascinated me ever since I was a child. I don't think anybody can get through doing a quilt without pricking their finger at least once. And every time I do it, which I do on every quilt, I always squeeze a little bit of blood out and rub it somewhere on the inside on the batting. So every one of my quilts has got my blood in it. ask the children if they have any quilts, and many of them do. One day, I went a little further and said to uh, one little boy, well, who made your quilt? And he said, my grandma did. What does it mean to you, I asked him. And he looked at me and smiled and said, it means my grandma loves me. When I was 12 years old, I saw a quilt that my grandmother made. She was four years old when she made it. 
I felt, oh my god, I'm 12, you know, I gotta make something now. So I just started to put something together, and my aunt, she'd seen, well, she'd done quilts too, and so she helped me with the first few. At 4-H, we had about seven meetings, and they started us off gradually with something little and showed us how to do all the stitches and everything, and then we had to make something of our own, whatever we wanted. Exhibits and competitions have always played a part in the quilting tradition. Quilts are entered first in local fairs. Winners then advance to district competitions. The best go on to the finals, where judges face the difficult task of selecting the grand champion. The current widespread interest in quilting suggests that this folk art will continue to be a colorful part of our culture. I decided to exhibit my quilts at the fair because I put a lot of work on them, made them really nice. Well, this is just the beginning. Isn't that pretty? And when you look at a quilt 72 by 90, it looks like a big job for one person. But sooner or later, you'll get it finished if you stick to it. It's just beautiful, isn't it? This way. This the applique, oh, oh, you can't good. even see the no, stitches. No, no, beautiful. Look at the sizes of them. Let's turn it. Let's flip it over here. Looks like. Did you see any spots that were missed in quilting? No. She's I really think covered so. it, isn't she? Eight to eleven Eight to stitches to the inch. Yeah, it sure is. Yeah, it sure is. <laughs> Have yeah. to make a decision here, girls. Yes, we sure Between do. Between these two now. As I move back to the to the white tablecloth that's covering the uh, quilt, I'd like you to announce the winner. I would like to say, in the first place, district number four is involved. So are you in agreement that this is first? I agree. Yes, I well, agree, agree too. The fair that is involved is Bob Cajun, and the winner is Mrs. Margaret Carr. <laughs> Congratulations, Mrs. Carr. Stand up and be recognized. Come on up, Mrs. Carr. Big hand for Mrs. Carr from Bob Cajun, Ontario. We are just delighted to be able to add your quilt to the collection which you see behind you, and we trust that uh, it's a big win for you also.